Today, I have the great pleasure of talking to composer, author, educator, conductor, Dr. David Schiff, Professor Emeritus at Reed College in Portland, Oregon, where he taught for 38 years. Mm -hmm. His music combines a wide range of styles, including jazz, klezmer, and popular music. And among his myriad writings are the music of Elliot Carter, the second edition of which came out in 1998 when I was two years old. So that's fun. Uh, and uh, most recently, uh, Carter, the first biography of the man published in 2018, both indispensable volumes on Carter. I found them extremely helpful in my own research. Um, and so Dr. Schiff, thanks for taking the time. Pleasure. I, I do want to get to talking about Elliot Carter and your studies with him. Um, but I want to start out with your life and career before you got to Juilliard. Uh, oh. So you're, you were a Jewish kid born in the Bronx. Uh, right. And, and I understand it into a fairly amusical family at the tail end of World War II. Um, and you end up, as you say, in, in Carter pursuing a doctorate in English literature at Columbia before eventually pursuing music. Um, so if you could just take us through your early life and how you got from your early life to, to where you pick up with your, your studies with Carter. Okay, I'll try to make it brief. Uh, the... Uh, uh, I was born actually uh, two weeks after the end of the war, uh, and uh, my father was in the army in Germany uh, when I was born, and, and returned when I was seven months old. Uh, and at that point, uh, my mother had uh, found an apartment uh, in the Bronx, and that's where we were living. Uh, and he actually wanted uh, us to come and uh, live on an American base in Germany because he was an officer and he said we'd have a better life there than in the Bronx. And my mother said, don't be ridiculous. I found an apartment in the Bronx, come home. Uh, so he did uh, and uh, found himself uh, uh, living in a fifth floor walk up uh, apartment. And uh, he wasn't used and he, uh, uh, after just a few years, he wanted to do something to sort of make the, the apartment special. Um, and he bought a, um, a big Magnavox, uh, we'd call it a sound system uh, now. Uh, and I, I researched this and it was state of the art for 1949 mm. uh, when he bought it. Uh, it had an AM FM radio and a three speed turntable. Uh, and uh, the, the main music uh, my family listened to, uh, really the only uh, music that they um, was part of their life uh, was Broadway shows. Uh, and one of the first albums that they bought um, it was the original cast uh, recording of South Pacific. I think that came out in 1950, so I'm four and a half at the time. And one of the things that happened, so this big Magnavox arrived, uh, and here I am, I'm four years old, and I took it over. Uh, I was at, at it all day, uh, listening to the radio, but uh, playing records. And I just listened to South Pacific all the time. If you get me started, I can sing the entire score from memory. Um, I don't think we have that much time, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, again, uh, one of the aspects of American cultural life back then was something called Book of the Month Club. And it was a, a way of really uh, building your literacy. Uh, what they did is you automatically, if you remember, they sent you a book every month. You could return it if you didn't want it, but they sort of chose the book. Um, and uh, around this time, Book of the Month Club opened a subsidiary uh, called the Music Appreciation Society. Uh, and their sort of gimmick was they had recordings, but one side was a recording and the other side was a kind of discussion of the music or analysis uh, of the music. And uh, one of the first recordings that arrived, because the society chose what you were going to listen to, was a recording of uh, Debussy's La Mer, mm -hmm. uh, conducted by Fancarian. And I just bonded with that piece. Um, I listened to it day and night uh, and other recordings arrived, Beethoven symphonies, Strauss tone poems, what have you, 
but Debussy was my guy and, and La Mer was my piece. Um, and that really, that was a moment when I think, um, you know, uh, I don't think I chose music. I think mu music chose me. Uh, that piece defined my life uh, somehow. Uh, that was the one thing that was going on that made sense to me. Uh, and uh, fortunately, my parents didn't know anything about music and they figured, okay, he's busy. We don't have to worry about him. So they let me just do this uh, all day. Um, and that was the beginning. And soon after that, I started um, piano lessons. Um, and uh, I became a voracious sight reader. Um, and again, I think that's because I really wasn't interested, I didn't know this at the time, in being a pianist. This was really, I was just interested in absorbing as much music a as I could. Um, and then um, when I was nine, um, I was taking piano lessons at the Bronx House Music School in New York. And they required, if you're taking lessons, uh, they required you to take a theory class. And one day in the theory class, which was taught by uh, Kenneth Wentworth, um, he put on Billy the Kid of Aaron Copeland. And the moment it started, I said to myself, I want to be a composer. And that, was the, that was the turning point. I, I once had the opportunity to tell Copeland the story, which was very nice. Uh, he, he just assumed, oh, doesn't that happen to everybody with my music, you know, so uh, <laughs> he was very pleased. Um, and uh, when I was 10, uh, my family moved uh, to New Rochelle, uh, New York, um, the suburbs, which had a very good music program in the schools. And uh, before too long, I was playing tuba in the band and bass in the orchestra. Uh, and I played bass, um, jazz bass and classical bass all the way through junior high school uh, and high school. And then I started taking piano lessons with Kenneth Wentworth at Sarah Lawrence, which was not far from our house. And one thing that happened there um, was after, at the end of the piano lesson, he would take me into the little music library and just say, take anything you wanted. And at that point already, here I'm sort of 11 or 12, uh, what I wanted was 20th century music. I had very little interest in really studying music before that. It just sounded old uh, to me. And I had access to all these scores. And, and so um, in no time, my favorite pieces of music in the world were um, Stravinsky's Agon, uh, which had just come out at the time. Uh, and Schoenberg Variations for Orchestra, believe it or not, uh, which actually sounded a lot like Agon, and only later did I find out that these were both recordings by Robert Kraft, and they were made at the same recording session. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it was the same personnel, so that's why they sounded alike uh, mm -hmm. in that way. Uh, and again, I was blessed with parents who didn't know enough about music to say, turn off that noise. Uh, so they let me uh, pursue this, um, and uh, and that went went on, uh, and uh, I had uh, a number of other teachers. The most important teacher in high school was a man named uh, James Weimer, Jimmy Weimer, um, who um, uh, taught many conductors later on uh, at uh, the Juilliard School. Um, and I met Weimer at uh, a music camp in upstate New York. Uh, and he would give me piano lessons, but they were unlike any other piano lessons. Uh, camp was eight weeks and I had a four hour piano lesson with Weimer every day. And we really weren't, he wasn't a pianist, but he was an amazing musician. Uh, and we would do things like analyze Brahms symphonies and things like that. Uh, and uh, my second summer at Stonegate, uh, I composed a um, prelude and fugue for Woodwind Trio, and it was performed there. And the maestro at the music camp, Herr Dr. Richard Karp, who was the conductor 
um, of the Pittsburgh Opera at the time. He was a tyrant of the old school. Um, and he came up to me afterwards. He said, Schiff, you're a composer. So that was, it started there. But um, I, again, uh, here I was, I, music was my life. I was also listening to a lot of jazz with my friends and playing in a jazz ensemble. Um, but there were no musicians in the family. And I really couldn't imagine a life, uh, a career in music. I, I didn't know anyone who had that uh, kind of career. Um, and uh, somehow when I was in high school, I became sort of the top English student. I don't know how exactly that happened, but it happened. And so I pursued that. And um, I went to Columbia as um, a uh, English major. Um, and when I was at Columbia, one of the things I discovered was that the music majors, pardon me for saying this, seemed to know less about music than most of the other people on campus. And that was a reflection. There were a lot of people who were tremendously knowledgeable about music. None of them were music majors. And I would hang out with them and learn from them. Um, and uh, also at that time at Columbia, I arrived at Columbia in 1963. In 1962, a new music group had started at Columbia by Charles Morin and Harvey Salberger called the Group for Contemporary Music. And uh, this was just happening in this country. All these groups were modeled on the Domaine Musical uh, in Paris. And the idea is that's, that's what's needed. And they performed right at Columbia. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and they performed their own music, but they also performed a lot of uh, Schoenberg, Berg, Bayburn, and also, um, uh, music that we now call uptown music, um, sort of Babbitt, Volpe, Carter. Uh, and Babbitt, Volpe, Carter, and the first couple of years, Edgar Perez usually were at the concerts. So that was very exciting to see the great men uh, there. And I must say, uh, of those composers, uh, 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 Carter, Volpe, um, Babbitt, um, uh, Carter and Volpe <clears throat> had the most appeal to me. Volpe's music, because it seemed incomprehensible. And I thought that was really cool, you know, <laughs> when you're young. <clears throat> but, um, uh, and I actually had discovered uh, for myself Carter's music, I think in high school with the sonata for flute, oboe, cello, um, and harpsichord. And then quickly followed by the second quartet of uh, and then the double concerto. Uh, uh, so I, I was already very interested in his music. Um, I was not in college. I was not composing. I, I was being an English major. I was spending a lot of time listening uh, to music. Um, I was not really performing very much. Um, and I was not composing. I was just taking things in. Um, uh, the other thing that happened, I think my second or third year at Columbia at the New York Philharmonic, Leonard Bernstein felt obliged to have an, a year of avant-garde music, even though it was all very alien to him, but he thought it was the thing to do. Uh, and one of the concerts that made the biggest impressions on, impression on me was a performance of um, Pitha Prakta by Yanis Zanakis. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I must say, Zanakis' music intrigues me because you look at it in the page and you say, what the hell is that? You know, I, uh, I, how did those notes get there? And yet when you hear it, it, it has this visceral impact uh, like no other music. And I, I don't know how he did it. Um, but I felt it at uh, New York Philharmonic when they started playing Pythoprocta because within seconds, most of the audience headed for the door. <laughs> they were just racing out of there. They didn't want to be in the same room uh, with this music. And of course, being 19 years old, I was saying, this is so cool. You know, I love this. Uh, um, so after Columbia, uh, I uh, won a fellowship uh, to study at, uh, in Cambridge, England, a uh, Kellett Fellowship. And there I met uh, two wonderful 
composers in residence uh, there, um, uh, Tim Suster and Roger Smalley, um, both of whom had studied with Karl Heinz Stockhausen. Um, and it was very interesting to go from New York, especially uptown New York, where I was based, uh, across the ocean to England and discovered there was a very advanced, knowledgeable music culture um, with a completely different listening list <clears throat> than you had in New York. And that really taught me how much of my taste was an accident. It was an accident of time and place. I just happened to be here. I, I heard this music. I was not hearing this music. And there was a lot of other music there and a lot of other points of view about music um, so that I needed to listen and to choose um, what I was going to do. I actually composed while I was at Cambridge. I wrote a crazy piece for string quartet, trombones and percussion sitting in the round. It was sort of Stockhausen-y. Um, but again, it was a sideline uh, for me. Um, and then uh, I came back to New York uh, to go to graduate school at Columbia to get a doctorate in English and uh, the Victorian novel, actually. Um, and at the winter break, my first year in January 1971, I found out that the Cleveland Orchestra was going to be performing uh, Carter's uh, Concerto for Orchestra uh, with Boulez conducting. And a good friend of mine from high school, uh, Peter Kogan, who was for many years the timpanist of the Minnesota Orchestra, uh, played in the <clears throat> Peter played in the Cleveland Orchestra, and he arranged for me to be able to go to rehearsals. Uh, so I actually took the bus from New York out to Cleveland. It, it was the dead of winter, um, and on the first day of rehearsals, I got to Severance Hall. Um, and um, sitting there and in walked Mr. Carter. And I, I think I had been introduced to him at a group for contemporary music concert, but I'd never really met him before that. Um, and he sort of asked why I was there and I told him and he had an extra score. He said, here, take the extra score, huge score uh, of the concert for orchestra. Um, and we basically hung out for the whole week um, and uh, one night we had dinner with Boulez, which was very interesting. Boulez was not the Boulez of later years. Uh, he was uh, he was a monster uh, at the time. Uh, you know, they called him even later. Uh, orchestra players called him the French Correction. Uh, <laughs> and here he was at one rehearsal. He's screaming at the cellos of the Cleveland Orchestra, the greatest orchestra in the world, that they have to go back to conservatory because they can't count. And so like that. And of course, that didn't endear him uh, to the orchestra members, and it didn't endear Carter to the orchestra members. And for me, this is the first time I had really seen uh, an orchestra put together a piece uh, of difficult uh, contemporary music in the Concerto for Orchestra. It's one of the most difficult. Um, it's I, hard to blame the, the, the cellos for not being able to, I mean, it's, it's the Carter Concerto for Orchestra, like, you know. <laughs> Right. Give, him a, give him a little bit of a break here. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was something, I mean, he was, uh, there'd be all these notes flying around and Boulez would kind of point at the third stand of violas and he says, you know, your A flat is under, you know, <laughs> like that. That's what he did. Um, and so I took notes and I actually, um, I went back and at that point I was studying with Lionel Trilling at Columbia. Uh, and I asked for his advice. I said, I've just had this experience at Cleveland and then I took notes and I want to write it up in, in some ways. Uh, and he arranged for me um, to meet uh, the editors of Harper's Monthly, who were friends of his. Um, and it was very old boys network. And so I went down there and told them um, about my experience and how I wanted to write about Carter in this piece and, and how the Cleveland Orchestra kind of struggled to put it together. Uh, and then a terrible thing happened. They looked at me and they said, we're very interested in this, but we're not interested in it the way you are. 
We're interested in the fact that you care. We want you to write an article about yourself. And that was the last thing I wanted to do at that point. You know, I, I did, that was, and it just kind of died there. But that was my first attempt at writing about Carter. Uh, and then um, uh, a few years later, uh, and this was, you know, at this point, this is where it's a uh, quarter of the double concerto, the piano concerto, um, the uh, concerto for orchestra, the third quartet. It's really the tough, uh, the tough stuff, the, this mo the monumental pieces. Um, and I, I was very uh, devoted uh, to them. Um, so, uh, and I actually, let's see, I have to backtrack here. So around when I was 26, um, the fact that music was my life, but not my career, became a kind of personal crisis for me. Um, my life, it just didn't make sense. Um, and, um, and I decided uh, wisely um, to sort of test the waters by, I registered for summer school at Manhattan School of Music. I took a placement exam in music theory. Uh, and I, I literally, I'd never set foot in a conservatory before. I didn't know how I'd feel about this place and how the place would feel about me. Uh, and I was very fortunate. I placed into a theory class taught by Ludmilla Ulela, who was then head of composition and theory at Manhattan School and a wonderful teacher. Um, and at the end of the course, at the end of the summer, I told her I was thinking of applying to the school and she said, uh, write me a violin sonata. So I wrote her, <laughs> I wrote a violin sonata and that got me into Manhattan School um, where my teachers were, uh, John Curiliano, who was uh, just sort of starting out at the time and Ursula Mamluk. And, um, even though I was studying with, with John, um, I was writing in this very Carter Zanakis style. I wrote this crazy piece for um, huge string ensemble, 10 percussionists and two conductors. I never do that, never have two conductors. That's a big, big mistake. But, uh, and, and with the two conductors beating at different speeds and times all the way through is totally nuts. But that's what, that's what I was doing at the time. Um, I mean, I, I think that's fascinating. I mean, I have a whole section of Ives, you know, books over uh, here. You know, that's uh, it's sort of my thing. <laughs> so, um, and uh, uh, so I was studying, I was writing that while I was work, working with John uh, uh, Criniano, and it was very alien to him. And he was helpful in a lot of ways, but still I got the sense that the music was very far from him. And I wrote to Carter and I asked if, he might look at it. Um, and one morning at seven in the morning, my phone rang, it was Helen Carter. And she said, Elliot, we'll see you today at two o'clock. So I went down to the apartment on, on 12th Street um, and I had my first composition lesson with Elliot Carter. I was about two hours long and he ripped every note I had written to shreds uh, I came out, I felt like a bleeding hole, it, but it was fantastic. Oh, yeah, I love those kinds of lessons, they're great. <laughs> <laughs> because it wasn't, uh, because he cared about the notes and he could see what I was going for, but that it wasn't, but it wasn't quite there yet. And he, mm -hmm. he um, and it was like every note from beginning to the end, it, it was just an amazing thing. And that's when I realized, okay, this is the person I have to study with. Um, and then uh, a couple of years later, I applied to the doctoral program at Juilliard, and then I worked with him uh, for three years there. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. You know, that's a that's a good look of your of your of your development and your your uh, event. It sounds like you know you you had sort of knowledge of Carter, and then like you're slowly and slowly, it's just sort of like you know it was it was like fate. Um, yeah. Just to get to a few questions uh, that I had after you know, reading, reading your books on him, um, he, he was, as especially your biography makes clear, very reticent to share details of his personal life uh, yes. and his private life, which, I mean, I respect that because it's like, you know, it's not really anybody's business, but it's still like, 
for biographers and interested composers and musicologists, like you kind of want to know, you know. Um, and one of the key questions that I had concerns his time at Harvard. Uh, and he doesn't study music. Uh, he gets to see in his one music class. Uh, he studies oboe, but that's over at the Longy School. Right. Um, and, and he really, he doesn't really care for the musical attitudes at Harvard at the time. And, and against his parents' wishes, he stays there for his master's right. to study music. Uh, was the graduate program really that different? Uh, otherwise, like, why would he stay in Cambridge if he didn't like the musical culture at Harvard? Well, I, I think that Harvard at that point was probably the only place that would take him. <laughs> because he had no credentials. Mm -hmm. you know, he hadn't written anything. He hadn't studied music. He took one music course. He wasn't going to get into Juilliard that way. Yeah. Uh, so he had the connection. And I think, I, I don't know exactly right now, off the top of my head, the sequence of events, but he, I think Walter Piston was the connection uh, there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I think it was an easy uh, transition. Frankly, I think, you know, remember this is happening in 1930. Uh, and I'm sure Harvard was happy to have anybody's money at that point. Yeah. After, after the uh, crash. You don't think um, of Harvard as like really needing money, but you know, <laughs> that's these days they got, you know, more money than God over there. <laughs> but at that time, I mean, that's, I, that's just, I, I've raised that possibility. Um, I think uh, it was interesting. Um, in 1986, I actually was at Brandeis uh, with uh, Carter uh, right after the um, Boston premiere of Pentode. Um, we went out to uh, Brandeis uh, and in the car, uh, it was Arthur Berger and, and other Brandeis people and the subject of Walter Piston came up and the, everyone was in agreement that he was the worst teacher ever, <laughs> which was a shock because he loomed so large. Um, but uh, uh, I, I thought that was, uh, that was a, a kind of interesting. So I, I think that uh, the one thing that Piston did was to say, you have to go to Paris. You have to go to, to Boulanger. Uh, and I, I think that the two years uh, he needed to get some, something down, some kind of training. He had no musical education, formal musical education at that point. So before he could venture to Paris, to Boulanger, he had to have something. And, and I think whatever he did at Harvard served that purpose. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. But it, it is sort of strange to, to read it and think, if he didn't like it, like why, he, he's such a, he comes across as such an individualist that he would just like, I thought he would just strike out across the country, but it's like, he, he stays, you know. Uh, yeah, the, the second question is um, Carter on poetry. So he writes these choral works early in his career, like he's very inspired by literature, other arts, um, and then almost a half a century later, he returns with a series of three vocal works, late 70s and early 80s. Um, and to quote Carter, um, pursuing differences more than affinities, Carter chose poems that seemed, at least on the surface, far from his own sensibility and personality. And then he argued with them. Uh, could you explain that a little bit for us? Like, what does it mean for a composer to argue with the text they're trying to set? Um, and what can composers today learn from Carter's often very difficult vocal writing? Well, okay. That, <laughs> um, well, I discovered uh, Carter because he had um, a literary training. I mean, that's where that was his education uh, in English literature and in Latin and Greek. Um, he, and he was quite sophisticated uh, in terms of literature. Um, and so, um, he would never approach poems, even early on, uh, naively. Um, and, and he would he would have a sense of what the issues were uh, in a poem. Um, and he also felt that as a composer, his role was to uh, not to be subservient to the poet, uh, but to sort of uh, to do a reading of the poems, which was his readings uh, of the poem. And uh, the most sort of explicit version of that is um, Syringa, uh, where, where Eliot actually said to me, you know, 
I, I decided to set John Ashbery because uh, he was so far away from me and it would just force me to do things that were different. But uh, here Carter actually created his own counter text so that there are two texts going on, the Carter text and the Ashbery uh, text. But I think he tended to do that uh, anyhow. Uh, and in some ways, for some poets, Ashbery loved it. Um, and, and he loved all the settings of his poems. Uh, Elizabeth Bishop was not happy uh, at all, although she was... She was happy at first, but then, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she was happy with the opportunity. But again, I think that, you know, Carter was way ahead of his time in, in, in the sense that, you know, he had a commission um, and it was for a, a soprano. And he said, well, if it's a soprano, it's going to be po poetry by woman. And he picked really the most important poet of, of her generation, Elizabeth Bishop, when I think we see that now. And it was not what most people thought at, at the time. Um, and then, but he didn't really know her. Uh, and her personality was very, very, and her musical tastes were very, very different <laughs> from his. But in a way, it doesn't matter because the stories he tells in those um, are his stories. So for instance, um, one of the poems he, he chose is, beautifully is, is Insomnia, and Carter was an insomniac. Uh, <laughs> so, <I feel> that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, he connected uh, uh, in that way. Um, and uh, sometimes it's a strange kind of uh, of thing, of relationship. I, I I don't think most composers would sort of get into these kind of wrestling matches with poets um, the way Carter chose to do. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes uh, the outcome is, is sort of hard to assess. I have a lot of trouble with the Robert Lowell cycle. Um, they're very difficult, uh, they're psychologically difficult poems. And I can't figure out if Carter wrote them as a kind of expose of Robert Lowell or, or what, because it's like a huge mad scene. Um, and, but he, uh, again, Carter was not afraid of wading into those waters. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I, I think that was uh, quite amazing with him. Uh, in terms of uh, vocal writing, um, uh, again, I think it's a challenge for, a tremendous challenge for singers. Uh, and a lot, as with all of Carter's music, I, I think that um, so much depends on performers. Uh, I, I have heard um, I think it was Jan de Gattani, uh, do Syringa, um, and she made it sound simple. She made it sound like the easiest thing in the world, and it was so wonderful, you know. That's very hard to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, she was a performer who could definitely pull that off. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that, um, but uh, the style, I mean, one of the aspects of that, separates Carter from a lot of other uh, American composers writing uh, vocal music. Um, there's no influence of jazz or folk music in Carter's music at all. So it's a, it's a not a vernacular voice uh, that we're hearing. Uh, and uh, that's hard for the singers. Uh, and yet it's, um, it's not just sounds, it's expressive. Um, so th that, that makes it even harder. Mm -hmm. he, he's really, I mean, he formulated his own, uh, techniques and his own, his own language, you know, and, and the, the literature on him sort of really focuses in on like how he, he went from like writing these early kind of Americana mosaic pieces. And, and it, it's not until he's about 50 where he really discovers his, or, or finally chisels out his, right. his place and then it continues on from there. Um, f finally on Carter, and you, you mentioned this a little bit before uh, about your first lesson was a two hour shredding session, uh, which you know, I, know, I know I get a lot out of those kinds of lessons, even if I come away feeling like I'm 
a piece of garbage. Um, it, 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 it seems like he wasn't one to really push his style on his students. And this is going to get more uh, towards your music specifically. Um, you're very much testament to that because your music sounds really nothing like Carter's. Um, so how do you think that Carter's hit and lessons with him really affected your music other than just a, like this attention to detail? What, what other things defined Carter as a composition professor? Well, one thing I should say is I was um, 31 when I started studying with Carter, and that was a real advantage. I think if I had been 20, like most of the other students at Juilliard, it would have been very hard, uh, just because his criticism was <laughs> so unrestrained. Uh, and he also uh, was not very forthcoming at all forthcoming with praise. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, he didn't see that as part of his job uh, at all. Um, and uh, when uh, my own, uh, when, when I arrived at, at Juilliard, again, my background, I'd, I'd listened to, you know, Stockhausen and Zanakis and, and Carter. I had listened to Richard Rogers. Uh, I listened to a lot of uh, Miles Davis and Charles Mingus, uh, and I'm and, and Steve Reich, and, and I'm trying to, in my own way, to figure out who I am and where I am in this. Um, and my first year at Juilliard with Carter, I wrote a kind of jazz piece of very much Mingus influence. Um, and, uh, and he was helpful uh, with that. Um, and at the end of that year, I, I made a very conscious decision to uh, spend the next year writing in his style. Um, so I wrote um, uh, three big pieces, um, a setting of a Hart Crane poem uh, for flute, uh, vibraphone, and soprano, um, setting of uh, poems by uh, Thomas Wyatt, um, and a, a string quartet. Um, and uh, I discovered a lot uh, by making this decision to write Carter uh, pieces. Uh, one of the things I, I found out is if you're at conservatory and you start writing pieces in the kind of flavor of the month style, all of a sudden you start winning prizes. You know, it's <laughs> <laughs> That's what the conservatory knows how to recognize. So it was it was good for me uh, that way. Um, uh, the second thing I, I found out was it really didn't affect Carter's teaching at all. Uh, you know, as you said, uh, he never talked about his own music uh, in any in a lesson. Uh, he never suggested, "Why don't you try to do what I do?" Never, absolutely not. The only aspect of his music that he would point to, and apparently Ravel did the same thing, was he would say, oh, you know, don't write that note on trumpet. It sounds terrible. That's what I did in this piece, and I had to fix it. So he would call attention to his own mistakes uh, as he saw it. Uh, but uh, uh, when, when my music really got very far away, uh, from his music, my third year at Juilliard, from my doctoral document, as they call it there, um, I completed my opera, Gimple the Fool, uh, which is not like Carter at all. And um, it has a lot of synagogue music and klezmer music and Kurt Weill and Mahler. <laughs> and um, that was the only point where Carter um, felt inadequate. Um, and, and again, I, you know, I think he, I had to respect him for this because he, he, he just worried that he would not give me <clears throat> the right advice in this style because he had never written in that style. So he um, arranged for me to take lessons with his friend Trudy Rittman. Uh, Trudy Rittman was this wonderful uh, composer who had written all the additional music, music behind under this action, dance music, overtures for all the uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein and Lerner and Lowe shows. Uh, and Elliot had known her since the 1930s. She was very good friends with Agnes DeMille. 
And so I'd go out to New Jersey to Trudy's house and show her the score. And she was very helpful. I learned all the tricks of the trade from her. Um, but actually, Elliot gave me great advice with Gimple, even though he felt it was very far away from me. He had that uh, ability. Um, so it, it was really interesting in that way. I, I think another aspect of his teaching, um, which was, you know, I think looking back at it, Carter was never, never thought of himself as a teacher. Um, and if you look at the history of his life, he walked away from one teaching job after another. Uh, at one point, he was offered a nice job at Princeton. He just turned it down. He said, I don't want to do that. Uh, and the joke at Juilliard was that, you know, he came to Juilliard on Tuesdays because that's the day the cleaning people came to the apartment and he had to get out of there. So he needed some place to go and he spent the day there. But he never, he didn't go to department meetings. He didn't hang out. Um, and he didn't get personally involved with any of the students. Uh, it was very, the thing that mattered to him was the notes you put in front of him. He'd look at those notes, he'd give you exactly what he, <clears throat> what he thought. And again, it was not, oh, well, David's writing this way. I can see in a year he needs to go this. I'm going to suggest he, he wasn't thinking along those lines uh, at all. That was not the role uh, he played. But fortunately, and I think one of the aspects of this is his music, he was getting a lot of performances then. And he, so he had a lot of ex real life experience of notes on the page being performed. Mm -hmm. So when he said, this will sound good, that won't sound good, change this octave, change this note, it wasn't theoretical. He knew what he was talking about. Uh, he was trying to pass along that experience. And I mean, I also have this collected essays. Um, and, and that's something he talks about in there quite a bit is he, he laments the state of American orchestras not playing a lot of, having the interaction between the composer and the orchestra, um, which you know, is is a shame, but it it goes down to I mean how orchestras operate financially these days. I think even before we are now uh, with orchestras, you know, the challenge with orchestras is always time, uh, and uh, really almost all of Carter's big orchestra music, the the later music's a little less demanding, um, but the big concerto for orchestra, Symphony of Three Orchestras, uh, piano concerto. Uh, really, the only way most American orchestras can do that, uh, those pieces, and Boulez used to perform them this way, is for them to be the only piece on the program. Uh, because there's not simply not enough rehearsal time uh, to put these together between Tuesday and Thursday, <laughs> the way most orchestras uh, work. Um, and uh, so Carter was kind of, uh, it, it was a kind of idealism that way. Uh, it was very interesting uh, when, when I met him in Cleveland. Uh, one of the things I saw, and I saw this repeated many times, uh, is um, members of the orchestra were shameless in telling him how little they thought of his music. <laughs> and right to his face, and this one, somebody wandered over from the Cleveland Orchestra and said, oh, Mr. Carter, I'm just sitting there playing stuff from uh, De Rosen Cavalier because it doesn't make any difference. Nobody hears what I'm doing anyhow. And 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 he just he just listened and didn't say anything. Um, but uh, this he chose to write that way. And and um, fortunately, very late in his life, he finally found uh, conductors like like Boulez and then um, Ali Nussen and, and uh, Barenboim. Um, who actually helped. Uh, but um, it, it certainly, I think most composers today, certainly in this country, but probably any place in the world, if you get an orchestra commission, you know what you're up against. And if you want to perform, you, you write something that's going to be performable within that framework. Uh, and if you want to write something that's harder, you write chamber music because it's rehearsed in a different way. Yeah, that's that's just the way that, that music has evolved. And I, moving away from Carter a little bit, I want to do talk a little bit about your music. Um, and in your retirement from Reed in 2019, you you're sort of I found like an exit interview on the on the Reed website. 
sort of uh, sort of thing. Um, concerts that, that they did. Uh, you mentioned the improvisational elements of jazz. Right. Um, and I can't say, I ha you have a book on Duke Ellington. I can't say that I have it, unfortunately. Um, but what struck me about him when I was, when I was researching him uh, were two things. One is sort of his incredible business savvy and his this relentless determination. Uh, and the second was specifically his relationship to improvisation and comparing it to like a dog on leash. Like there has to be some element of that, but also you have to have, the composer has to have some level of control. Um, and I know that different composers deal with Im improvisation and it's improvisatory sounding elements in different ways. Um, and I was just sort of wondering if you could uh, tell us a little bit how you contend with improvisation in your own work. Well, uh, I'm trying to think, you know, aside from, uh, I, I, I had been, I played jazz, but I never uh, thought of myself as a jazz musician. Uh, I think largely because I never thought of myself as a performer. I was never interested in performing. Uh, but uh, I, I had the experience of uh, improvisation. Uh, and sometime, I'm trying to think about 15 years ago, uh, when I was uh, at Reed, I got an email from a man named Larry Karish. Uh, and he said uh, he was a Reed graduate and he'd like to come to the school and give a, he was a pianist, he'd like to perform there. And I kind of ignored it because I got requests like that all the time. And then a couple of weeks later, um, uh, I found out that, that uh, he'd won uh, some big awards. And I said, okay, we're gonna take him seriously. So uh, Larry came to read, and Larry was an amazing improvising pianist. Um, and he could improvise in a lot of different styles. He was an amazing stride pianist, but he could also, he could improvise convincingly North Indian music on the piano and make it sound legitimate because he had studied it uh, very uh, closely. Um, and uh, he and I really uh, hit it off um, and I had the idea of writing a um, concerto for him in which I would write the orchestra part and the piano part would be completely up to him. He would have the orchestra score. And, and I remember this is one of the last pieces of mine that I talked about with Elliot and Elliot kind of looked at me in horror. You know? <laughs> but so my feeling is, you know, uh, imp there's a, uh, I, I think that when, <clears throat> I think it's a mistake to ask um, musicians to improvise who aren't trained in it. Mm -hmm. And one of the weird things still in our musical training uh, in this world is that even though in the history of music, most musicians improvised, Baroque music, everyone improvised, uh, you can go through Juilliard and not, never have a class in improvisation. Uh, you can, because you're working on your Chopin and everything else. Um, so uh, I don't ask people to improvise who are not trained to do it because then they kind of just uh, quote other music they know. Uh, mm. uh, but when I met Larry Karish, when I saw what someone who was really a great improviser could do, I was, I knew that it, um, <clears throat> it made most sense in writing a piece for him to just let him uh, do it. Uh, so I wrote this uh, piece, um, Mountains and Rivers, um, and uh, he performed them, and, and it was just um, fantastic. And then uh, a few years later, unfortunately, Larry died, um, and I added a, a third movement uh, called um, Clouds and Stars as a kind of memorial, and I asked um, uh, my friend uh, Marty Ehrlich um, to play uh, that. And uh, he recommended uh, pianist Myra Milford. Um, and she arrived, um, first rehearsal. I had never met her before. And she came in and she just killed. I mean, she just, it was fabulous. And it was her way of doing the piece. It wasn't Larry's way. Uh, of doing the piece. And to collaborate with somebody like that or somebody like Marty Ehrlich, um, uh, to me, it's, it, 
couldn't be better than that. And then I, I've had the other great pleasure uh, of working with uh, the great jazz violinist, the Regina Carter, who's played my jazz violin concerto many times, never the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I say, Regina, could you leave this in? And no, no, no. You know. <laughs> that defeats uh, the purpose of the improvisation, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I think when you have great improvisers, let, let them improvise, set up a, a, a framework uh, that allows them to bring to the music everything that they have. And uh, I'm very comfortable in that. I, I, and uh, I, I've been very fortunate in working with a wonderful improvisatory players, trombonist, um, uh, Dave Taylor, uh, also. Uh, and uh, so th that's, that's very important in my music. Uh, you know, uh, the other music I, I write, I, um, I have found ways, which is more typical, I think, of a lot of other American composers, of kind of uh, dragging classically trained musicians, kicking and screaming over the line uh, into jazz and, and to sort of get them there uh, in a way that feels uh, legitimate uh, to me because there's also, this is music that's all around us and it, I, I don't want to leave it out. Um, so I do that also, but I, I love working with improvising musicians. It's funny that you mentioned it's, that, that performers do have a tendency to just noodle around with stuff that they know when it comes to improvisation, because um, I read a piece fairly recently as part of a larger, larger work, but for this movement, it's, it's just a, it's a piano quintet. Um, and the piano, the strings are doing stuff in the foreground, but the piano is just like tinkering away, quoting like old TV show tunes and like <laughs> Chopin and Debussy. And I have a section there, which is basically like, quote whatever you want, whatever key, because like that, that's the whole point. I figure that even a, even a performer who's not good at improvisation at least like can play their favorite little little tune or or, or ditty. Um, yeah, uh, uh, just a few more a few more questions. Uh, I don't want to go too far over time, but um, uh, in addition to jazz, uh, Jewish themes have a strong influence on your work, uh, pulling from your own culture, not just in klezmer music but also in in broader ways. Uh, and I was going to ask you about about Gimple the Fool. You, you mentioned it a second ago. Um, based on the, the, the famous short story, um, a notable singer was, well, he wrote only in, in Yiddish. Um, and obviously this is an important work of, of fiction. I mean, I have it, if I, if I bend down to get it, I'll yank all my cables out, but I have a, an American short story collection in it. And that's where I first uh, read Gimple the Fool many years ago. So I don't remember all, the, all that much about it. Um, I, I was just wondering if you could tell us more about that work Specifically, you know, what can you tell us about about writing it, and, and um, uh, you know, what what made you write an opera based on that? Maybe is that the place to start? Right. Um, well, one of the things that was happening in my life this is back to nineteen seventy four, um, I think. Um, I was uh, studying at Manhattan School of Music. Um, and I had a course in opera composition with uh, uh, Nick Flagello. Um, and I was also teaching music theory and literature at Hebrew Union College School of Sacred Music. Um, and uh, they needed one, I really was teaching music theory there. And one day the dean called me in and they, they needed, the students needed to have a kind of humanities type course. And he looked at my background with Cambridge and Columbia. He said, why don't you do that? So I decided, I had heard about Singer. I had never read him. So I assigned Gimple the Fool as a reading for that course at Hebrew Union College. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that immediately jumped out to me was that the singer was um, writing about a part of the world where my uh, grandparents came from, uh, from uh, Galicia and Poland and from uh, Warsaw. Uh, and Gimple the Fool is a, a baker in a, in a shtetl in uh, Galicia. And my grandfather was a baker's apprentice in Warsaw before he got on the boat to come to this country. Um, and my my family never talked about 
the old country or where they were from. So this was, it was reading Singer um, taught me all sorts of things about the world that they uh, uh, came out of. So then in Flagello's class, we had an assignment to write a libretto. So I decided I would write a libretto um, based on Singer's story. And then because I'm too clever, I said, okay, Stravinsky wrote an opera in Latin. I'm going to write an opera in Yiddish uh, because it's the original uh, singer wrote the story in Yiddish. And, and what I discovered uh, very early on was that the, the translation by Saul Bellow is very different from the original. The original is much earthier um, and in a way a lot more interesting. It's bumpier. Um, so I actually went down, Singer was giving a reading and I went down and I asked him for permission. And he said, sure. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, then it turned out that my uh, parents' synagogue, uh, Bethel Synagogue in New Rochelle, was planning to have a Yiddish weekend um, in uh, the fall of 1975. And so I decided to sort of write uh, the music, uh, to write a, a preliminary version. And because I was teaching at Hebrew Union College School of Sacred Music, my students were all singers. So I cast them and I uh, cast uh, a, a very important role for the cantor uh, who I grew up with in New Rochelle, Lawrence Avery, who's a legendary cantor. He had a high tenor voice. He was Juilliard trained uh, and, and he uh, was a wonderful uh, inspiration. Um, and uh, so a lot of things happened. Uh, one of the things I, I didn't speak or read Yiddish um, and my uncle, I, I got a copy of the story in Yiddish and uh, my grandfather was in the extended care in the hospital and um, my uncle, his son, would come up and would go to see grandpa and uh, my uncle would read him the story in Yiddish. And, there, and my grandfather would explain something because a lot of it was very close to his life and close to his uh, character. Uh, and then the other thing that happened with Gimple that was kind of life-changing. Um, so at that point I'm writing this kind of Zanakis, Volpa, Carter kind of music. Um, and then one day that summer, um, I was in midtown Manhattan. And as sometimes happens, the overture of the opera just popped into my head. Uh, and I sat down, I actually had a music notebook on, <laughs> and I wrote it down. Like it was just there. Mm -hmm. uh, and the big surprise was that it was tonal. It was not Brahms tonal, it was Schiff tonal, but it was, it was not Zanakis or Carter or Volpa uh, at all. Uh, and the interesting thing I found out is that every composer of my generation, John Adams or whoever, we all had that story. The day atonality died <laughs> for us. <laughs> and it was because by then it was kind of old. It was time for something different. And the thing that had seemed very new 10 years before had just become a kind of academic thing that everyone uh, knew. Um, so, um, and then uh, the opera was done at my parents' synagogue at that Yiddish weekend and then done in New York and then we did in Boston. And finally, uh, when I was in my third year at Juilliard, I uh, orchestrated it with help from Trudy Rittman and extended it and it was a wonderful training uh, for any composer in music theater. You know, I think that if you're writing for Broadway, there's a whole process with BMI of workshops and the, and the piece is developed and it goes on and, there's a, and you learn a lot about it. Uh, I think to this day, uh, if you get a commission from an opera company, they can kind of wait for the whole thing to land on their desk and then they kind of deal with it. And I had the advantage of kind of workshopping my own opera. And I uh, learned <clears throat> what 
worked, what didn't work, where I needed music, what kind of music. And so there was this kind of gradual uh, development. Um, and that became, uh, uh, and as I said, the, the interesting thing, I'll tell you Carter's best advice <clears throat> for uh, Gimple. He said, um, make an on, use an ensemble with interesting sounding instruments in it. Because otherwise, if you just use a standard ensemble, you'll be working so hard to make it sound interesting and it just start right off. So I had a very important saxophone part, very important amplified harpsichord part, um, the, the very important tuba part. It was not a standard sounding orchestra at all. And that came, came from Elliot. I wouldn't have done it. It wouldn't have uh, occurred to me. And again, I think that shows how his, his uh, sort of knowledge of, of, of music had nothing to do with writing his music, with, you know, other, with other people writing like him. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, he was very helpful with that. I do have one final question. And this is sure. a, something, a viewer submitted question. Um, inspired by a, a clip of Morton Feldman and Elliot Carter talking. I believe Ursula Oppens is also, this is kind of a famous clip. Um, and, and Feldman is complaining about the 25 minute piece and how like, you know, music doesn't, you know, he's, you know, doing the thing. I just, I just, I go as a Morton Feldman for Halloween, but I don't have the, the, the outfit on. Um, and he was like very much against this clock of, of contemporary music. Um, I, I, the, the question kind of inverts that. And um, what this viewer wants to know is, is a three to four minute composition such as the limitation found on the side of a record, um, is that constraint something that contemporary composers can use effectively? Um, and I'm reminded incidentally of that Ellington found that restraint very limiting and he found ways to kind of get around that. Um, but the, the idea of the, the miniature of uh, the sort of a, a, a single length um, piece, it, is there is there relevance uh, for that in applying that to contemporary uh, sort of art music? Well, I think there's a whole range of possibilities. You know, Ellington wrote extended forms, but he spent most of his life writing three minute pieces because that's that was what you did in jazz because that had to be one side of a record. And his three minute, he's the master of the three minute uh, piece, um, and the the sense of um, sort of expansion or compression I mean the um, I had this experience the first time I uh, performed Terry Riley's music uh, before I performed in C which I've performed many times uh, was pieces called um, keyboard studies which we did at Cambridge with my friends uh, Roger and Tim um, and um, one of the things we did, and I, I've done this with students when we do in C, is I said, okay, let's do it, the 15 minute version. Okay, we did that. Great. Let's do the half hour version. Great. Let's do the 90 minute version. <laughs> <laughs> you know, keeps getting now approaching Feldman. All right, <laughs> and then you approach Feldman, and, and it's really interesting. You're, you realize how much your your sense of time changes that way, and you could do the reverse. I don't think it'll necessarily work with, with uh, Terry Riley, uh, but I'm thinking of pieces like um, uh, one of the pieces uh, that made a huge impact on me when, already when I was in high school uh, with the uh, Altenberg leader of Berg, um, and each one of those is very, very short. Oh yeah. Uh, and they don't need to be one note longer. <laughs> you know, so that, that's another way uh, of writing. Um, and I, I think also um, it's nice, uh, I once had an experience, I, I forget which piece of mine, um, was played, there was a performance at uh, Chamber Society of Music uh, at Lincoln Center. And it was a special concert. And what they did is they did two pieces. And then there was intermission. And then they played them again. 
And I wish that was done more often uh, with uh, new music and a lot of music. It, and so many people in the audience came up, they said, that was so great hearing <laughs> that second time, you know, because mm -hmm. I was really, I was hearing things I, I didn't notice before. Uh, and so I, I think that, you know, uh, a short piece, uh, sometimes it's frustrating because uh, it demands a lot of the listener. You have to be there for that 90 seconds or, or, or two minutes, and maybe you're not, maybe you're distracted. And so to have another, chance and and, and uh, very often I find the first time I hear a piece I'm having irrelevant thoughts I'm have, making irrelevant comparisons oh this is sort of like this is sort of like and it's only the second or third hearing when I'm the logic of that particular piece is I'm, I'm connecting with that I'm recognizing that um, and that can happen in a in a short a short piece um, beautifully so. Yeah, I, I do know that uh, when I did my undergrad, they did student composer orchestra concerts, which is was quite good. But, you know, the <laughs> the rehearsal process was a little bit scary sometimes. And they, they would do that. They would they would play a piece and then they would play it again, uh, except for the long pieces. And of course, the conductor came up to me and was like, Thomas, your your piece is a little bit too long. We're just going to play it once. And I'm just like, well, gosh, I hope you record the uh, the dress rehearsal because I want to get a, I want to get a recording out of it. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, thank you so much. Uh, that's, that's the end of my questions. And we're, we're, uh, Dr. Schiff, it's, it's, uh, thank you again. And it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Mm -hmm.